Well, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar all about why Tai Chi is such an amazing adventure. My name's Sue O'Kell, I'm from Barefoot Doctors Crew and I'm here tonight to help the webinar run smoothly. Uh, before we speak to Stephen, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody for the absolutely massive amount of questions we have had pre-submitted, which has actually changed the way we're uh, approaching this webinar tonight. So what we're going to do is Stephen's going to talk to you about why Tai Chi is such an amazing adventure, and then we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time going through uh, the questions that you've asked, because a lot of them do uh, appertain to his new Barefoot Doctors Revolutionary Tai Chi training. So without further ado, let's say hello to Stephen. Hi Stephen, welcome. Hello, Sue. Thank you very much. Yep, this is Stephen. I'm part of Barefoot Doctors Crew 2. And, uh, yeah, I'm sitting in a car doing this as the traffic zooms by. So you're going to get full sense around the ambience of living in the normal world. Tai Chi. This is very exciting for me. And I'll tell you why, on many levels, actually. Um, way back in my late teens, early 20s, I remember I was became very close friends with one of my Tai Chi teachers. Not the master, but one of the the teachers at the school, and uh, was invited around to his place for dinner. And obviously, he was well more advanced in the Tai Chi than me. And I was all gushing and excited about this amazing thing that I was doing. I just was, it blow my mind, changed my life completely already, and reframed my whole relationship with existence at the most radical level. And the because I've done martial arts since I was 11, the, the martial arts aspect of it as well was just just riveting and fascinating and all I wanted to do was talk about Tai Chi and I got invited around to his place for like a dinner party and there were lots of people there and uh, I started trying to talk to him about the Tai Chi and he quite clearly didn't want me to as if it was in bad taste you know it's like this is something that you don't talk about you just kind of keep it to yourself be discreet about it it's not fair to foist it on other people um, no matter how enthusiastic you are uh, this is just something to keep discreet, and it was really interesting because with most things, you're you know everybody that does it wants to shout about it, and, and what I found is is over the years, the, the decades, uh, watching how yoga, which I've also done for since I was a teenager, not not it's not my primary discipline, but it's something that I do a little bit of every day because I used to do a lot of it every day, and eventually the martial arts totally took over, but. Um, so, so I, I look at yoga with utmost respect, as in a way like the mother of all exercise. And um, watching how that became a, such a huge mass market commodity uh, as such, and, and by doing so, kind of in a way lost, for me anyway, lost a lot of its mystique. Um, not that mystique is the, the most crucial thing in the world anyway, but it lost its mystique for me. Uh, the kind of magical, mysterious quality of it seemed to evaporate in a, in a kind of sea of glossy magazine coverage. And I noticed that no matter how many people tried to promote Tai Chi, it never did that. And that's very, very interesting. Yet it has grown and grown and grown. And if you count the amount of people in China uh, with this huge population who do practice Tai Chi on a daily basis, is probably if not the most, one of the most practiced uh, arts that there is in the world. But nonetheless, in our Western culture, it has never gained that kind of fashionable status, and I'm really, really glad that it hasn't. The reason for that, I think, is is that, and actually, I'm glad it hasn't. This might be about to change all that, but nonetheless, the, the reason I believe it hasn't done that is that with yoga, you can go to a class, you can learn a few postures, you can learn all the important postures that take your your spine in all the different directions it needs to be stretched in or, or, or elongated into. And then you can practice those on your own at home. You don't have to go into extensive study periods and practice periods to learn the, what you need to gradually kind of take you through your life. Whereas with Tai Chi, um, the, 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 it, it's so hitherto so difficult to learn it um, that I don't think many people have the uh, the keenness to stay with that. It's just one in maybe 200, looking back at all the people I've taught over the decades, I'd say it's probably about one in 200 that will go all the way with it, even to the, you know, the martial aspects and all the rest of it. But, but then only that one will continue and carry on with it. Um, so it's a, kind of a, like a minority interest, and that, that appeals to me. 
However, I've always found it really frustrating because the joy that I get from it myself and the joy that I see others getting from it who practice it regularly is so profound and fascinating and unlike any other activity or the joy derived from any other activi activity that I know. Um, even sitting meditation, which is incredible and beautiful and important, or standing meditation, uh, qigong, and all the other stuff, the, the, none of them quite deliver that same flavor of joyfulness within the body. And um, the other thing that is amazing about it is that no matter where you go in the world, and I have over my lifetime gone and lived in and stayed in and moved through many, 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 many places, many different kinds of cultures, and felt those sensations of disorientation or being displaced or not belonging or feeling a bit weirded out and so on. You've got this constant. So wherever you are, whether it's Delhi in 105 degrees heat or New Mexico up at a mile and a half in altitude or um, the outskirts of Paris, or wherever it is that you are, you do the same form and it's the same form that's been passed down exactly intact for hundreds of years, if not thousands in some instances. And um, this gives us constancy, but a constancy that's delivered through movement, which is a beautiful paradox. The other thing that happens is it doesn't matter how messed up you are, uh, psychologically, emotionally, physically, within reason, of course, you can always do the Tai Chi and it always makes you feel better. So if you're in a really duff mood and you, your outlook's gone really gloomy, and there's nothing you can think affirmation-wise, there's no visualization you can do, there's no talking to any friends, or no matter what techniques you use that will bring you out of, that, out of the doldrums. Just do a round of Tai Chi and it shifts you. You're not feeling that way anymore. And you don't even have to think about changing your space, you just do the Tai Chi. As well as that, it doesn't matter how achy or painy you are, I mean even there's been the odd occasion where I hurt my back really, really badly, my lower back was from an injury for the uh, actually doing martial arts as a, as a, as a teenager. Um, and uh, th th yet with the Tai Chi was the one set of moves that I could actually do, even in a you know, hunched over state, that gradually straightened me out again. As well as which, it gives you suppleness of the, in the body. Um, it gets the energy in the blood flowing so that you look like, well, all my friends say that I've got the Tai Chi tan, which is because I do it outside every day, wherever I am, and there's actually quite a lot of sunshine. Uh, around the world where, when you do it every day, in England or wherever. And, um, the, but the circulation increases to the face, so they call that the Tai Chi Tan. You get this lovely glow about you, and you feel energized. You just have the sense that you can pace yourself and keep going for as long as you need to. The, the other thing is, is that Tai Chi is a metaphor, so that by practicing it, as well as getting the actual direct benefits from it, it serves as a kind of template or a moving pattern that informs your life and everything you do. It brings it a certain balance and a rhythm and a shape and a, a process. Um, in other words, everything you do seems to fall in with the pattern of the Tai Chi, so that everything you do eventually becomes Tai Chi. And it means the supreme ultimate state. It means that the state of being at one, viscerally, palpably with the Tao, with the, with the unseen force that informs this entire universe. So you, you, you feel very much part of the flow of everything. Hence, it reduces sensations of loneliness or being cut off um, and so on. And then there's the other aspect, the, the martial arts aspect. People don't generally learn Tai Chi to become great boxers, and yet the form itself, Tai Chi Chuan, the full name, means the supreme ultimate fist or boxing style. And when you know how to use it, which comes later on down the line, it gives you this amazing skill in self-defense, um, which relies on a certain softness and humility rather than a confrontativeness or an aggression uh, or a sort of competitiveness. It's quite the opposite. And because of this, you find you don't get into fights with people. People don't act aggressively towards you. They sense that you're all right, that they kind of like you. They get a sense that your energy is harmonious, no matter how weird or messed up they are. They seem to kind of respect that and feel comfortable around you, so don't give trouble. And the, the way that this works, if you can handle yourself in, in, in a kind of like combative situation, uh, representing the most sort of extreme uh, event that you might find yourself in, it certainly works in, in normal, so-called normal everyday life. 
because every interaction, every transaction, in a sense, is a, a competition. You know, there's a sense of who's got the more strength here, who's got more clarity, who, who, who's the energy with, and so on and so forth. The Tai Chi gives you a beautiful, harmonious way of feeling the other person's energy and intuiting, hearing what it is that they're really asking for, and therefore we're able to give it more freely and cutting through lots of the sort of superficial layers of communication which we use to obfuscate rather than to connect. So it helps you connect with people in a much more loving, harmonious, and, and wholesome way. Um, I, this is the reason that my friend didn't like talking about the Tai Chi, because it's so gushy. Thing is, I was uh, teaching a group of people in Ibiza um, for friends who just wanted to really learn the, the Xing Yi and the Tai Chi the, uh, the styles. And um, the, the Xing Yi is much older than Tai Chi. It's also Taoist. It works on the same principles. But to look at and to, yeah, to observe and also to practice in a way, it's more brutal. It's more straightforward. It's more direct. It's, it, it's quite obviously a martial art, similar in a way to the way karate is practiced. And you know how when you practice karate, you where you see people doing it, they walk up and down in straight lines, uh, throwing one punch after another. It's the same move repeated on each, you know, on each side until so they really get the, swing, the, the hang of that move. And it's exactly the same with the Xing Yi. You practice the, the 12 animals and the five elements, and then eventually a linking long form. But you practice all these, these different elements and animals individually. And you can go up and down the line as often as you want. And it's never boring. It's always exciting. It's always really enriching and empowering. And it's easy to learn. It's not easy to perfect, for sure. And we think they take ages. But to learn it, to get the moves, people were getting it really fast. And in this group, it was the Xing Yi moves that they were getting really quickly, the Tai Chi not. Reason being is the way Tai Chi is taught, is that you have one posture, which moves into a different posture, and then into a different posture, and then a different one, and so on, until you go all the way through first the short form, and then the long form. And it's very, very, very difficult to learn it like that. It's counterintuitive. It's not the way dancers learn uh, choreographed dance sets. It's, it's totally different to that, and it's difficult. And I found that even working with practice dance, like professional dancers, they found it really difficult picking up the form. Um, whereas teach them a set of, of, of dance moves, they get it almost instantly. And the reason for that is, is because it's counterintuitive the way it's, the way it's taught. There's a lot of value in that. Um, however, it's difficult, and people don't have the time, generally, to go every week or twice a week to a class, learn the moves, and then go home and practice them straight away at least five or six times so that they don't forget them, and then build up on it the next time you go back and so on. And it takes six months minimum to learn the short form, and then usually another year or so to learn the long form, if that's the way you do it. Anyhow, I've always found this really frustrating, which is why I developed School for Warriors, which is why I wrote all the books I did, because it was the Tai Chi essence I was trying to share with everybody and felt that maybe you don't need to learn the actual Tai Chi. Maybe you can cut straight to the effects of it, the internal game, the inner game, and, and just work with that, and that will transform everything for you, which is true. Hence, School for Warriors is very successful, and all the books that are written about this have been very successful in the sense that lots of people have benefited from it. Um, however, I've always felt like I was holding back, that I was somehow, not cheating, but um, withholding uh, something of value for everybody. And it was merely because I couldn't find a way to get this stuff across that would work quickly, that would take quickly. I even tried at one point, where I used to do these Tai Chi camps up in Pembrokeshire in Wales in the summer with about 30 or 40 or 50 people or whatever out in the well, the mountainside, they're very, very beautiful. Um, and I got it so that I, with everyone's permission, using hypnosis um, and, and performing the form for them over and over, but suggesting that they had a camera that was videoing the whole thing and it was going straight into their subconscious and storing that, um, that they could actually learn the whole form in one weekend, which they did, and it worked. Uh, at the end of the weekend, there were 40 people doing perfect, perfect Tai Chi short form like they've been doing it for decades. And, and they were really loving it. They didn't need to follow me. They were just doing it without instruction. Amazing miracle. And I kept saying to them, if you don't practice this within the next hour, at least three or four times on your own, so you make it yours, it will all go. Because you've downloaded so much information onto your circuit, there's no way you can hold it there unless you really go for it now. And of all the 40 people, one carried it on, which is beautiful. I'm very happy for that guy. But it's a shame for everybody else that they didn't. 
And I know why they didn't, because it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's a lot of information to deal with. Anyhow, I'm, I'm really at the end of my little ramble here. Um, in the forest in Ibiza with this motley crew behind me doing the Xing Yi, uh, I stopped doing the Tai Chi Luo was suddenly, and I said, hey, listen, do this with me. And I just was making it up as I went along. And I started going through the, the forms in the short form, actually the long form really, it doesn't matter which, but the main, all the main Tai Chi forms, the, the postures, the, the, the techniques, if you like, um, you know, the punch, the ward off, the kick, and so on. And doing them exactly as you do it in the Xing Yi. I mean, I was, I was improvising because this is nev it's never done that way. Um, so I was like walking forwards in a straight line just with one posture to the left and to the right, to the left, to the right. And then stepping backwards in what in Tai Chi is called step back to repulse monkey, which is the most elegant re uh, retreat. Uh, step that I've ever seen in martial arts, and it's hard to beat it, it's hard to improve on it. So rather than repeating the forward motion going backwards, I just kept backwards all the time in, in, in the, uh, the repulse monkey. And lo and behold, every single person there got it, the same way as they got the Xing Yi. So then, I carried on with that until I'd gone through all the postures in, in, in the form. And then I showed them the short form, and within an hour, they all had it. No, most of them didn't carry it on, not because it wasn't, they didn't, it wasn't, it was difficult to, but for the same reason, it wasn't really their interest. But they got it in one hour. Now, had I had another hour or so with them, had they practiced that for a week or so, I could have then taught them the whole long form in an hour. Now, this has its disadvantages, which if you don't spend a long time investing in something, you might not value it as much. But the positive aspects would far outweigh that, because if you can learn all the forms of the Tai Chi easily, and you can doing it in, in, in this way, then it only takes a very short while to put the short form together and then the long form. And you shortcut it like a, a, a good fat year and a half of hard learning um, into and condensed it into probably a matter of, a, of two or three weeks, really, if you really go at it. And that's a beautiful thing, because then you have the Tai Chi, you start feeling the value that I'm feeling, and then I can start talking about it more to everybody. And, um, you know, indulge myself. Uh, that might be the ultimate motivation, I'm not sure, but really I think it's to just be able to share it, because it, it's amazing stuff. So then, uh, happened to me at exactly at that time, a couple of really talented young German filmmakers, lovely, lovely guys, who just wanted to do something with me. They didn't know what, they just wanted to make a film, just some kind of film. They had two cameras, they had all their gear, the weather's beautiful, the, the sky was really blue, the light very bright, the backdrop's very beautiful. And I said, I'll tell you what, I've just created this, and what created, I've just stumbled upon this new way of teaching Tai Chi, which is actually quite revolutionary. And I'd love to put together some kind of training and make it look pretty lush so it's nice to watch as well. Uh, so people can learn it like this, because I'm not going to spend my time going around the world teaching people, so this would be the perfect way. And that is the result, um, or rather this is the result. How about that for a monologue sitting in the traffic? Marvellous. Um, I wonder if we could go into some of the questions because you, you've kind of rattled through um, all about Tai Chi and yet we've got a lot of questions about form. Um, and this, yeah. is, this is from Alberto, but he's echoing quite a few people who have tried Tai Chi or they have looked at how many different forms are out there and they're a bit yeah. confused. So Alberto said, yeah. Yang style, Chen style, 24, 48, 108 form, so many varieties. How can people yeah. choose? Well, it's kind of like you let it choose you, really. That's the magical way. But um, if I could just give you a kind of fairly crude, uh, my fairly crude understanding of how the different forms arose, you had apparently the original was the Chen family style, which tends to be less Taoist, more Buddhist, more Shaolin in its flavor. Um, it moves fast, it moves slow. You have cannon fist punches, uh, you know, kind of chicken hops and all sorts of techniques which are more common to the Bagua and Xing Yi. Um, and then one of the, of the Chen masters had a student called Yang Cheng Fu in about 1800 and something, I can't remember when. He was, he was quite a, a big guy, a uh, quite tall guy, and he was brilliant. He was his, maybe one of his top students, and he felt intuitively, and I think also from, he'd been studying some ancient texts, and he felt that there would be more value in homogenizing, no, not homogenizing, uh, uh, normalizing the tempo of all the moves so that the whole practice was done at, at an even pace. 
and that would keep the energy flying like silk rather than it becoming far, slow, hot, cold, and all the rest. Um, he felt that the Chen star had, had its failings, and he wanted to improve on it. Um, he then had a, a fellow student called Master Wu, who developed his version out of the Yang version, which is the one that Lou Reed uh, practices. That's the, the, the most famous person I know who does it. And I learned Wu as well for a couple of years and, and got, you know, got the long form down, but never really gelled with it. Um, there are brilliant practitioners of it. It's a lot more angular and less flowing looking than the Yang style. Um, it doesn't quite have that same grace, but it's got something else that the Yang style doesn't have. It brings out a, a different aspect. That sources for courses, my taste is, you know, I tried it, I stuck with it, and then one day I just thought, no, nah, it's not for me, I just dropped it. It just wasn't harm harmonizing or, or, or benefiting the other thing. Then there was Sun, who, uh, Master Sun, who was, I think, the early 1900s. He developed a very, very beautiful style, the Sun style. It's not easy to learn, there's not a lot of people teaching it. It's also very, very beautiful, and it harps back to the ancient imperial style of Tai Chi, which is the flavors of which you get in all these forms, but this one seems to have the most that I've seen. Uh, kind of interesting, delicate. Uh, I'm not sure how useful it is as a, as, a, as a martial art, but then I wasn't ever a student of it. The son was also famous for his Bagua as well. Um, uh, then there's the, and there's loads of others as well, but there's the 2448 and those ones. They're the modern communist Chinese uh, versions of the original Yang style. Um, and also really good, they're just, they're, you spot them because the practitioners do it with their legs very, very bent as if that's what it's all about, uh, you know, because Tai Chi is all about learning to sink your weight. The real masters of it, no, don't bend their knees very much indeed, because it's not about the, the physical, it's about sinking the weight internally uh, and therefore having gravity. Um, uh, yeah, and that's kind of a, 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 I mean, there are more I know, but right now off the top of my head, they're the ones. Um, but what you, what you find is, is that a practitioner of Tai Chi who's kind of got it, is, I know that's very subjective, but somebody's really got the joyfulness and the lightness and the flow, and that when you watch them, you just feel transported into a kind of timeless realm uh, where, where you can see them moving, but you can't see how they got from one position to another as if it almost was done by magic. Um, that it doesn't matter what style they do, you'll feel that Tai Chi essence. Uh, it's most common, I think, in the Yang practitioners. Uh, that I've come across, as well as which Yang is the most popular, it's the most widely practiced around the world, so therefore it's the easiest to find people to practice with, and it's the Yang style, the original Yang style, that I do. Um, I, 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 I learned as, at one point a modern version of it by, uh, that Chen Manqing developed. He was also he was a student of Yang. Um, he was considered one of the great masters of the last century. Um, he, he, and it's a, it, he was a little guy, and he had to lean up, uh, lean back a bit to kind of face off to his opponent. And so his form is more, the back is straighter, and the, the moves are much softer. It's the softest one of all, and it has a lot of value in, it, in its softness, but for me, lacks in body mechanics, in, in the sophistication of his body mechanics. The Yang Chen Fu style, which is the one I did, because he was a big guy, he bared down on his, he bore down on his opponent, so the back is slightly forward in, in, in the movement. Um, uh, and it has a very sophisticated uh, exp exposition of, the, of body mechanics, which is kind of what it's all about, really, in terms of the martial aspect and the health aspect as well. Um, yeah, so all the postures that I'm teaching here are all Yang postures, and that's just my, my preference uh, that I've stuck with. I'm not saying it's the best, but I think it is. Okay, um, and again, we've had a huge number of questions um, in about Tai Chi and Qigong um, from Sharon in Australia and Liz uh, in the UK, Trace in, uh, in the US and Clara in the UK, all asking what are the similarities and differences between Tai Chi and Qigong um, on a spiritual or energetic um, wavelength, if you like. What are the similarities and differences between Tai Chi and Qigong? Okay, well, the, all the, um, the three main Taoist-based martial arts, the three internal boxing styles, uh, Bagua, Xing Yi, Tai Chi, each of them had always had their own kind of um, uh, set of warm-up exercises, preparation exercises to balance the body, strengthen the body, increase flexibility, 
uh, focus the mind and get the energy moving in preparation for doing your martial arts forms and or combat. And each of them develop their own style of, um, of warm up exercises, which in time became known as qi gung, work, uh, working the, on, the, on your qi. So you have a Xing Yi style of Qi Gong, which is one of the, the, the one that I tend to practice most, which uses a form of tensile strength. And generally, the feet are together and the legs are quite straight, so not, not bent at all. Uh, it's the most strengthening of the three. You have the Bagua Qi Gong, which is a little bit more poetic and quite bizarre and quite difficult to do, in fact, which is generally done with the legs quite wide apart and quite bent. And then you have the Tai Chi Qi Gong, which is the most uh, popular one. It's the one that most people know about which doesn't use tensile strength generally, it uses quite a soft arm and the legs are generally quite, you know, fairly wide apart in a wall stance, you know, shoulder width at least and, and the knees are bent. The energetic effects of whichever style you do, oh yeah, so anyway, then Qi Gung became a thing in its own right pretty much around about the 70, 1975 um, when Chairman Mao uh, said it was okay to start practicing all the ancient arts again wanted to revive them, the new the cultural revolution. And Qigong was noted as being really efficacious at healing cancers and all sorts of conditions. And so it was taken up in a medical style among, in lots of hospitals through China and sought therefore as a healing, as a health, um, a prescriptive kind of health uh, technique. Um, it, it, it dates back, way back, way back, uh, based you know, animal movements and so on, which have always been there at the bedrock of all the practice. But as preparation for martial arts practice, reason being, when you do the qigong, yes, it has a fantastic effect. And I have to say that if I only had 20 minutes to get myself together in the day, it would be the qigong moves, that whole set, that I would do before I did the tai chi. And if I had to leave the tai chi, I would have to do that because I need to have my body uh, you know, symmetrically balanced, the energy flying, the muscles strong, the flexibility there, the mind centered and, and all the rest of it. And I'll kind of do the Tai Chi as I move along through the day, or do the Xing Yi, or do whatever you want to call it. Um, but the ride, the fun of it comes when you do the Tai Chi. That's when you get the high, that's when you get that, whoa, man, I'm flying. That's when it feels like a, an adventure. The Qi Gong does make you high, it makes you very grounded and very strong and it's very beautiful to do. I couldn't live without it myself. Um, but it's as a warm-up for the, for the tree, the tree bit, the bit where you get really high and you really fly and you feel your, you want to call it your angelic nature. That's with, the, that's with the Tai Chi. That's when you let go into the dance. It's the warrior's dance, the spirit dance. Um, and I, I, that, look, you have to understand, all this stuff is an art. I'm an artist, so all I'm doing is giving you my version, today's version of my interpretation of these arts. I'm not saying, you know, you'll find somebody who's some boffin somewhere. No, 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 that's not true. Cheating's been going much, much longer. Or it's been developed much later. Whatever. It doesn't matter. This is the way I've been taught it and the way it was always passed down to me. And I've got a feeling probably it's the right version just because of the guys who, who passed it down to me before all this stuff started getting, you know, popular or well-known about. Um, talking of popular and well-known and uh, your references to yoga earlier, um, we've got some questions in about yoga and Tai Chi. Catherine uh, in the UK says, is Tai Chi wisdom older than yoga? And Manuela in the US and Catherine also in the US say, how do the benefits of Tai Chi compare to those of yoga? So did yoga and Tai Chi come about about the same time and are their benefits different or similar? I absolutely have no idea, and I don't know anyone who ever has had an idea of which came first. Some very kind of plausible theories are that it all started in India and moved across to China. Um, but then there was there are texts that show that when the Bodhidharma went from India to the Shaolin monasteries and taught them the movements, because you can see they were too sedentary, the monks, um, he found that they'd already been practicing some kind of form of self-defense anyway. Um, and some sort of animal stretching movements and so on. And then the Taoists reckoned that they had their stuff going well before the Shaolin temples were going as well. Um, but then I don't know, really, nobody knows. I mean, it, I don't know if it really matters. They, they definitely both are steeped in that level of antiquity. You get the sense of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of agreement in them. You can get the sense when you do them. 
And I'm not one for reverence, as you probably know. I mean, I'm, the, the, the biggest paradox is that this is the only thing in my life that I do religiously to the, to the word. You know, I, I won't change the form. I've never dared to. I wouldn't even want to because it's beautiful doing the thing that's being passed down. Whereas anything else and everything else in my life, I always will do it my own, my own way. Um, so anyway, these come from that, that ancient time. They, they both have a primordial sense to them. Um, the, 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 I don't know if it really matters. I mean, it was obvious that the Indians developed and perfected the, 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 the art and science of stretching the body and moving the breath and the prana and, and, and situating the mind in the body um, to the highest level in the, with their flavor, whereas the, the Taoists did exactly the same with their flavor. The main difference being uh, is that with Hatha Yoga, the postures are static, and the movement occurs in surrendering progressively more into the into the stretch, whereas with the uh, Taoist style, the, the it, it's not static. Well, there there are some static uh, maneuvers, but most of it is is in motion, and it's it's working with circles and spirals and constant flow. Um, the the benefits are similar and different. Um, there is definitely a certain sprightliness that one gets from practicing yoga every day, a certain uh, kind of posture that, that you get, like a, a childlike posture, very open and upright and, and so on. Um, the, the, uh, and there's um, other gone for ages with the benefits of yoga, but that's not what this is about. Um, the, there is a tendency on the downside for, for some people to get a little bit rigid and, 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 uh, and stiff, ironically, uh, in their nature. Uh, or it seems to appeal to sort of rich and stiff people, I don't know. There is that danger, you, you get that. Whereas with the Tai Chi, um, the, the, the benefits of, the, of the, the, you don't get quite that postural thing, but you do get a very grounded sensation around a Tai Chi person and a childlike way of moving the body around, a quite kind of free, innocent way of moving, yet very, very collected and moving as a single unit. So it, it seems that yoga is, is, well it is brilliant for stretching out the muscles, it's incomparable. Um, the, the Tai Chi seems to lend you a fluidity and a collectedness and a, and a focus to the way you move through life. It's more about motion. Um, the health benefits I think are probably equitable. The, the, uh, but come, at, come around from a different angle. The, the Tai Chi, the Chi Gung, all this stuff, it massages the five vital organs um, specifically in such a way as to, to increase their functions, which then go on to, to uh, control all the other functions in the mind and body. Um, and it definitely gets the blood, the blood pumping round. It's known to, has been proven, and excuse me, I don't have the studies uh, in front of me, but you can you know research it. It's been proven over the last 50 years or so to uh, have a major curative effect in such things as TB, um, oh I could go on, uh, but, but all kinds of, you know, osteoporosis, arthritis, and all sorts of uh, problems that affect people, insomnia, anxiety, depression, um, I, I, I'll go on about those later in a bit. In fact, some of the great Tai Chi masters, one of the greatest ever, uh, T.T. Liang, who I was blessed to meet, about 20 years ago. He started when he was 52 because he had some illness. I think it might have been TB or that might have been Chen Manching, I can't remember. But healed him and he, got, he, he loved it so much that he got into it like a crazy man and became, by the age of 72, he was reckoned as being one of the great masters on the planet. In fact, he was the one that said life begins at 70 and he died at 90 something or other. He was pretty old and healthy and happy. Um, so, so the Tai Chi, Qi Gung, the Taoist style seems to have perhaps more of a curative function, as well as which the, the, the science of that, uh, the various postures affecting various organs and how they can be used for healing, has been much more uh, cohesively passed down, as far as I know, than the Vedic sciences, uh, as far as I know. Um, what was the question? So yeah, they, are, are they of similar benefits? Yeah, yeah they are. But it's just a completely, completely different flavor. It's kind of like if you fancy a Chinese meal or a Japanese meal or Indian meal. You know, it's like you'll get full 
uh, it will hit the spot, and if the foods well cooked and the ingredients are good and organic, you'll get all the health benefits from from any of the three. But the experience is different. You know, the flavour and therefore the way you feel about yourself in life is is different. It's it's a matter of preference which you're drawn to then. Okay, well, David in the UK says, um, referring to practicing Tai Chi, is it the precision of movement or the feeling that's important? Oh, well, it's both. Uh, hi, David, it's both. Um, I mean, initially, I'd say emphasize always the feeling, because if you're not getting the feeling, uh, it's hard to see what the value is in getting the movements precise. However, the feeling really only arises in its, in its refined uh, state. Uh, through precision of, of, of movement. However, the precision of movement only follows the principles of movement. And the principles of movement are actually what I teach in School for Warriors 1. Um, it's how you hold yourself and as you move around. Uh, following those principles, the precision somehow over time takes care of itself. There, there's no shortcut to becoming precise of movement. That's the joy of daily practice, because the more you practice, or the more uh, regularly you practice, uh, the more you get those moments of, wow, look at that. Look at me doing that. And I didn't even know quite how I'm doing it. That's how so-and-so teacher used to do it 20 years ago. Look at me, and I'm doing it now. And you haven't tried to make yourself do the movement, movement perfectly. It's just done itself for you, because you've been following the principles and practicing every day. And eventually, the movement refines itself. That's, that's my experience of it anyway. I've got two related questions here, um, which is, sort of relate to exactly what you've just been talking about there. Um, this, this first one from Ron in Brazil, who says, how do you know when you are effective in the art and the movement, not just moving your arms and body? And Penny, relatedly, um, Penny in the US saying, what are you feeling internally when you've mastered Tai Chi? So how do you know when you've actually mastered it, I guess, is what they're asking. Uh, well, the first, uh, Ron, the, that question, I think that what happens is you, uh, once you get used to making the moves and they become familiar to you, you would, there are ways then of practicing them with a partner. So you could get someone to push on you and pr provide resistance and you then can test where you're crumpling, where you're holding firm, uh, where the energy is flowing and you can test moving forwards in, in shape and seeing where the weakness is. Um, it's really actually all about getting your bones to sit in the right structure, in the, in the right configuration, so that they kind of lock into a shape, and then you become invincible. That's kind of really one of the big secrets of it. Um, and, and so a lot of that is practiced in, in pairs, but you can feel it as you do it, because the, and this is the, the, for the, Penny, was it, for the, the second yes. question? That there's a, there's a, a, oh, how do I, look, you please understand this is, highly subjective, and I I'm, can only be inadequate in my description of it. Um, it's a kind of fluid sensation that radiates from the belly to the extremities. And it's a fluid sensation in the feeling of it, in the sense of it being a bit like uh, oil that you put in a car. It's that kind of um, consistency. Um, uh, uh, and it's neither really hot nor really cold, but it's comfortable. It doesn't feel icy. It doesn't feel boiling. Generally, it just it just feels it feels comfortable, and it feels feminine. But that doesn't mean it it's it's vulnerable. It feels feminine yet contained and protected. Um, uh, feminine in that it moves freely and flowingly and in a curvy way, rather than in an angular in an angular way. There's a feeling of being buoyed up uh, constantly um, from within. In a, in a kind of, a, a cot, there's a sense of cotton wool in, under the skin. There's a feeling that the skin has got underneath it a kind of protective um, layer that, that's not physical. It's, it's definitely energetic, but it's how it feels. It's as if someone has, yeah, has inserted kind of a layer of some kind of magical, very pleasant feeling lagging just under the skin all over the body, including in the face and everywhere. So that everywhere feels quite padded. Uh, this doesn't mean that you get fat and pudgy. It just means you feel kind of padded, so that when, if you were to get, to get hit, um, it doesn't actually hurt unless it hits your funny bone or whatever. You don't get the same sense of get. You know, I mean, I've been practicing it for years. You know, decades as a combat form. So you yeah, have a lot of messing around. I've got a couple of things that I do that with fairly regularly um, to test it out, just for fun, really. And um, 
But you don't, when you do get whacked, which you will occasionally, you can't help it, it doesn't hurt. It's really strange. You get this feeling of like their punch or kick has landed into cotton wool. Um, by the same token, we're on the, uh, the attacking side, and bearing in mind that I know that most people who are going to learn this aren't interested in the, the martial aspects initially at least, um, it, it gives the sensation of when you get hit by somebody doing Tai Chi or kicked or whatever, um, it doesn't feel nasty and sharp in that stinging kind of like bruisey way. It feels like being very reassuringly thudded with an iron bar wrapped in a lot of cotton wool. That's exactly what it is. So you get the, the, the movement happens. You get thrown back across the room, which always has made me giggle. I mean, it's, it's really kind of exhilarating sensation. You actually feel like you're flying. Um, and you can feel the, the impact, but there's no actual pain unless the person wanted to deliver pain. That's at a more advanced level for whatever reason, and it's, that's a, it's not relevant here. But, the, but the, 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 yeah, the, there's this beautiful sensation of being buoyed up and protected from everything, and yet connected more to everything as well, in a kind of soft way. They talk about four ounces, 110 grams of, of impact with uh, reality around you. So nothing bangs you with harder than four ounces, and you don't bang anything harder than four ounces. Always intelligible, sensible connection. Uh, between you and an ontological reality, in other words. So we've talked about the actual physical movements, um, but Elsa in the US has got a question about the chi. Um, she says, how do the movements move the energy? Um, well, in my experience of it, could you say that your name, what's her name again? It's Elsa. Elsa, hi. Um, it, it, it's like a pumping motion. So that the kind of twisting and turning and the opening and closing of the various parts of the body in sequence um, seems to get, you get the sensation of it pumping the chi and the blood, of course, uh, around the body. Simultaneously, and maybe on a slightly different, less mechanical level, because all the postures are basically boxing postures, um, over time, you start to quite spontaneously, but also you, you, you know, specifically focus on it, uh, visualize uh, an opponent. So when you see people doing the Tai Chi form uh, solo, what they're actually doing is slow motion uh, shadow boxing. Uh, and all good boxers will do shadow boxing. You have to do it as part of your training. You're visualizing an opponent. You're visualizing what they can do. You're visualizing what your, your counter will, will, will be to that. Um, so when you're um, doing the form and you're visualizing somebody punching you, kicking you, strangling you, doing whatever, and you're visualizing as you do the movement how that's going to kind of break their hold or block their punch or kick or, or what have you, or throw them and, and, and so on, um, this focuses your intention in a particular kind of direction, and that mobilizes the chi. Wherever the intention is sent, the chi, and then the blood follows um, instantaneously. Uh, that's just a thing, like a kind of, I, I've got to say physiological, but I guess, I guess it's metaphysiological uh, fact um, that you kind of just experience when, when you're doing this actually. So when you're punching with the right hand, say, slow motion, your intention is going through the right hand and beyond. And you can feel your chi being mobilized down the right arm, like a, a kind of the fluid moves through the arm. And it, I'm doing it now as I'm talking with the right hand, actually, I've just noticed. And, and it's just the sensation of, <laughs> it's a sensation of mmm. That's all I can describe. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, hearing you say mmm, maybe a good time to tell people about the the actual training itself, because a, lo a lot of the other questions are related to things like how long should I practice and what time of day and that kind of uh, thing. So um, just going into what Barefoot Doctor's revolutionary Tai Chi training actually is. Um, the training, as Stephen's been explaining, is all about simplifying what can be a very complicated learning process, which, take, which has taken Stephen many, many years to master. Uh, and as he mentioned before, it's not about mastering every nuance, this training. It's about getting the basics down so that you can then really enjoy the feelings of the Tai Chi and go on to, uh, to practice and to master it at your own pace. So the way the training works is it's video-based. So 
you have to use a little bit of your imagination in that you can imagine you're in a live one-to-one -one class with Steve. And in fact, it's quite nice because you can imagine you're in a lovely spot in Ibiza watching Stephen go through the moves. So you watch the video. He then asks you to listen as he's demonstrating, to relax and to follow the movements. And that's basically as simple as it is. So you literally listen, relax, follow the movements, and he goes through each movement several times. Now, the secret to success then is to turn the video off so that you're not actually having to watch it, but you've internally digested it, you've internally, um, you know, really got that move. Turn the video off and do some practice on your own because, as Stephen has said many times, you need to make the Tai Chi your own. Now this training is a way of doing that in the simplest way possible and I wonder if you want to say anything else about the actual mechanics of the training Stephen. Uh, no but you know one thing I do keep wanting to say is that it was it's my intention and always was from the beginning that I haven't got time to do everything at once but once people have got into this and have uh, got, you know, I would say mastering it sounds a bit silly really because I take decades, but I'm, but you know, I've got, I've made it theirs and they're, they're feeling fluent with it and, it and it's and it's working. My intention then is to then do, uh, I've done them before, but to do a Tai Chi short form training and then a long form training, which will be so easy and quick once you have all the moves. Uh, that's the point of it. Um, Really, so this is like it, it, this is like a the beginning stage, but it's the most important one because once you've got this, the rest of it is a piece of cake. Um, and other than that, it's pretty simple. It's done the way I would teach you if I was with you, very patiently, and uh, you can see exactly what I'm doing. You, it, it, there's no kind of mysteries or blind spots in it. It's really quite simple, and uh, you just have to become a bit like a dancer, really, and just follow the moves and do them along until you've got them. And then you move on to the next one. And I think it, you'll find it takes a very, very short space of time. That's the how, when, when you should practice, uh, whenever you can, really, as long as it's every day. Mornings are probably better because, um, you know, if you've got to go out and face the world um, each day, it's good to go out with your chi strong. It's good to go out protected. It's good to go out into the world having had a little while talking to your higher self, your deeper self, your your maker, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, making contact with the ground of your reality, in other words, and finding your flow and, and, and elegance and grace uh, before you go out and meet everybody, so that you're kind of going to be able to transact more successfully, more smoothly and easily and safely with people as you go about your business. But, you know, you can do it when you get home instead, or do it both, which is, which is the best. How long you need to do it for is completely up to you, and it, it depends on each person, but... If you, the key with all these things is just doing a little bit every single day. It's the every single day bit that is crucial. And you know how we're all so resistant to doing what works. And this is the only way. You know, you just have, it's five minutes a day. It doesn't have to be much more than that. You know, I would never suggest anyone makes it their life mission. Um, it, 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 it's only rare people that would want to do that. I mean, even I, 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 I've made it my life mission. Even I don't have it as my life mission because there's, there's so many other things to do in the world as well. So it, it's just a sort of five minute a day, ten minute if you like it. You know, you'll find there are days where it feels so good you just want to keep doing it for as long as you've got, and then you do. But don't force it. Um, James is asking, does it matter if you're a complete beginner? You're completely new to Tai Chi. Well, actually, no, I mean, it's perfect for that. But, I, but, but that, I mean, that's who I had in mind. Always, whenever I talk to Tai I'm always thinking of someone starting from scratch. Because for a start, it's the most exciting thing. You know, from going from nothing to something is the biggest move there is. And it's just so lovely watching that happen for people. Uh, so this is absolutely uh, aimed at people who've never done it before. But also, I have to say that as a, 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 a kind of practice, a seasoned practitioner. Um, this is useful for me. I, I use it, uh, this actual practice style, uh, once a week or so. Um, you know, because I don't need to go back and learn all the postures again. But I do do this um, because it just feels really, really good. So I think that anyone who's already doing Tai Chi, teaching Tai Chi or whatever, will also benefit. Could also benefit a lot from this. Um, you know, it wouldn't need to spend as, as long learning it because I already know the moves. But just to pick up the way of doing it, the the, the, the style of training. Um, it would be well worthwhile, I'd say. 
So I think it's just um, worth repeating what that style of training is, and it, it's the way that you've you, you've taught Xing Yi, and it's uh, as I understand it rightly, it is one move repeated again and again and again. We're not worrying at this stage about linking it up to linking all the moves together. It's exactly. one move yeah. Yeah. in a line, practice several times, uh, uh, again and again and again, then do the next move once you've got that one. Am yeah. I right? Yeah, and no, no, I have to say also this. Look, it, it wasn't like that, you know, like some brilliant original invention. The Xing Yi's been taught like that for, for, for centuries. I was just doing the traditional Xing Yi training with the so it's like when I got it, I thought, why has no one ever done this before? This is the most obvious. And I thought a bit, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe something bad will happen. You know, cause, I mean, it's like, no, wait a minute, this is just so obvious. I don't get why no one's ever done it before. Um, and that's really where the that's why it's so exciting because it's really obvious, but no one's ever done it before. Okay, we'll we'll get into some more nitty gritty questions about the uh, the training itself in a minute. But this is an interesting one um, from Tony in the UK, who said, "Are the movements like a moving meditation?" Oh gosh, I was just saying that exact thing to somebody uh, today. He was thought, asking me about uh, standing meditation, and um, and and then I was saying, "Yeah, well, you know, standing meditation is the is the one just before you go into moving meditation, which of course is what Tai Chi is all about." Um, the, the idea, yes, that you are in the meditative uh, position internally. You've situated yourself optimally within, um, so that if you were sitting, you could be in a state of absolute stillness for however long you wanted to be, or if you were standing, likewise. Um, but now what you're doing is you're taking it into a very slow, measured, purposeful, but graceful movement. And then that trains you, as long as you do it, regularity to be in a state of meditation all the time as, as you go about your business and therefore be more effective and enjoy doing whatever you're doing more. This is probably quite a difficult one to answer actually because it's a bit, uh, it's a bit um, subjective I think and it's from Carol in South Africa and she says how long would you say it takes to remember the form? Um, she says it's so difficult to get the sequence and the repetition so appertaining to the new training how, how long would you say that it takes to, to really get the moves? Uh, about five minutes to get each one really is that you know I mean it depends how how coordinated you are movement-wise, how quickly you let go into something uh, and feel your confidence in the movement. But I don't think, you know, it's like, Carol, if you, you know, when you were young, or you probably are young, I don't know, but um, you're probably younger than me for sure. Um, you go to a club when you're a kid and you watch somebody doing a dance, a kind of move. And you remember in the old days, it was everyone did the same dance sort of routine. Uh, it, it, it hadn't all gone into all different kinds of dance yet. And, and it didn't take that long, did it? It was like, you know, you watch what they were doing and you felt a bit awkward for a minute or two and then you had a little go and within, you know, certainly within a half an hour or so you had all the moves down and you were dancing your way. Well, these are actually much simpler than that because it's just one repeated move. It takes, I don't know, no time at all really. Um, because bearing in mind that by doing it this way, you perfect as you go along. You don't have to get it right to move on to the next one like you do the traditional way of learning. So quickly, quickly, really quickly. It's just really natural. It just feels like dancing, actually. It feels like going to a dance class. Much easier. And uh, another Carol this time, this time Carol in the UK. Um, and she makes an interesting point here. Can you learn Tai Chi alone, i.e. watching the videos, with no one to correct the moves? That is a really good question, Carol. Um, I think it depends um, on, you know, eye to body coordination uh, stuff, watching the video and then translating it, um, how, how, what a previous experience you have and so on. I mean, one friend of mine, I did do a Tai Chi short, I did a couple actually, Tai Chi short form training DVD years ago, decades, and I've lost the masters now, unfortunately, but I didn't really like them anyway. But um, I had a friend who learned it, and he'd done various things like White Crane and, and Kung Fu stars before, so he had a way of of moving, he got you know he needed the, the weight to move, and he learned the whole Tai Chi short form absolutely perfectly from just watching the DVD and came and showed me. And I couldn't believe it. It was like I taught him myself, which I had I suppose, but directly. Um, the only thing it was is that because the video was all done against the white ground, he'd lost his direction. That he, he got confused and he ended up facing in the wrong direction. But the actual moves themselves were were.
were pretty perfect. The other thing I like to say, Carol, everybody as well, is that I was thinking about this today. I mean, it's obvious that if if enough people go for this one, it, it lends itself to a kind of a day at some point in London or somewhere or around the world doing doing uh, days just to kind of get everybody um, corrected and moved on to the next stage. So there will be, I imagine, live um, uh, versions of this as well at a certain point. But yeah, I think you can learn it this way without anyone correcting you. It's pretty simple. I think you see that when you looked at it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay, that's probably a good idea to um, let everybody know um, how much the training is. Um, now, as Stephen mentioned, this, this is a new training that he's developed and it has only to date been shared by a small group of students that he was teaching over in Ibiza. So part of uh, the special introductory offer comes comes with a bit of a comes with a bit of a condition, if you like. And uh, don't worry, nothing too nothing too heavy. Uh, Stephen's wanting to get feedback on this because it is a new form of training. It is a new way of learning Tai Chi. He's hoping that a lot of people who've never tried Tai Chi before will have a go just to switch on really to the immense amount of, of benefits you can get from it. So there's a special introductory offer. Um, the training will be priced at $180 from 2013 onwards, uh, but for the next couple of weeks um, it's going to be available for $97. Now we're going to cap uh, this at 100 people, so if you want to get this introductory price, please do make your move before Christmas as soon as you can, um, because we will be uh, we will be putting the price up to $180 for 2013, but we're really, really keen to get your feedback. Stephen wants to know uh, what you like about it, if there's maybe anything he can improve, some feedback so that if he does run some live events, there are, he knows what to focus on for you. So uh, the special introductory offer for the Tai Chi training, which is all the videos, it, ta it breaks down the short form into all the separate moves. It gives you an introduction. There's a uh, an introduction from Stephen about the chi as well. So he'll introduce it, he'll take you through it, you'll have each of the moves separately so that he will show you the move, he will take you through a practice sequence of that move, you'll be able to stop the video, practice it yourself, really make it your own before you move on to the next one and then at the end of the training you'll see the entire sequence put together, the whole of the short form. Okay, so I'm going to move back to some uh, some questions now. Um, can I just say, can I just say something? Because I really feel to put this in perspective. Because you know, it's our pricing things is a, a bit of a mysterious art. Uh, I I am always the egalitarian in my desire to share everything. I think things have to have value, or people don't value them. But I don't feel anymore that it's the time to claim ridiculous value for things, and therefore people will think it's ridiculously valuable. I, it just seems that. that this wrong. There's a there's a colleague of mine. He's a, a brilliant teacher. He sells Tai Chi online trainings for uh, I think it's ten thousand pounds. It's like fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars, something like that. Um, which is great and fantastic for him and anyone who could afford to do that. It's brilliant. But I do think that this is like a way of, of making it very widely available. And if I say to myself, it is generous because um, I want to share it. I want people to get it. I just thought I needed to say that. So I was thinking about it today. Fantastic. Okay. So if you're interested in the training, uh, you need to go to Stephen's main site, which is barefootdoctorglobal.com, and then put in forward slash Tai Chi, and that will take you to the page where there's a whole pile more information uh, about the training, and just scroll on down to the bottom if you decide you would like to uh, give it a go. Um, we have a question here from Jennifer in Australia, and she's a School for Warriors participant, Stephen, and she wants to know how this training is different to the Tai Chi workout that came with School for Warriors. Yeah, um, good question. The, the Tai Chi workout uh, that comes with School for Warriors is part of the Tai Chi warm-up system. So that's kind of, that has like the Tai Chi Chi Gun, uh, or one aspect of it, uh, as it appertains to preparing for doing the Tai Chi form. So you would traditionally, uh, at the start of the class, do that Tai Chi warm-up set to warm up, and then you would do the Tai Chi form. So this is the Tai Chi form that we're talking about. It's the Tai Chi proper, if you like. Those exercises are brilliant and amazing. And they, they're they the warm-ups for the Tai Chi, so that, that's the difference. The School for Warriors training um, is the inner game of the Tai Chi. So that's the inner 
set up for doing the Tai Chi, the combination of those three, you're pretty much there. That's it. You've, you've got the whole toolkit then. Okay. Um, now we've been to, we've talked uh, about health benefits, and I'm going to come on to some specific questions about uh, conditions people have been writing in about um, and asking if Tai Chi can help with. Um, but before we go into sort of physical conditions, we've had a couple of people, Amanda in France and Rebecca in GB, um, asking about um, mental states and asking about. Um, can Tai Chi bring you peace? Can Tai Chi help with relaxation, um, specifically for anxiety and stress? So, is Tai Chi useful for that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you know, that's what I was alluding to before. Um, it's brilliant for restless souls. I mean, I consider myself restless by nature. I'm always like looking for the next bit of stimulation, and I'm kind of like very curious and excited, and like a little boy, you know, running from one thing to the next. That's my nature. And therefore, the yoga, as powerful and wonderful as it is, uh, was always very, very difficult for me, very difficult to stop and actually be completely still uh, from nothing. You know, from movement to, to stillness like that was always a little bit difficult. Whereas with the Tai Chi, you got your, well, I got my restless way, and I'm like, my mind's running around doing this, doing that, do I do this, do I do that? And then I just get up, and I start making the moves. And it takes that restless energy and sublimates it, channels it into something beautiful and flowing and smooth, uh, which gets rid of all the noise. And by the time I'm done, I am in a state of perfect peace and relaxation, and my stress is all gone. And then it takes a lot to make it build up again after that. And if it does, I just go back and do a little bit more Tai Chi, and it's gone again. And um, doing it before you go to bed is brilliant. If you do Tai Chi before you go to bed at night, not too, too close, give it you know, 20 minutes if you can uh, before going to bed. You sleep so well. You get into bed feeling energized, yet completely calm, so not like zipped up. You just, you've got energy moving through you, but it's beautiful energy. And you lie down to sleep, and it's like an, a really active, uh, conscious sleep. Very, very beautiful way to go to bed, Tai Chi. Okay. Um, I'm going to come on to some specific physical things now. Um, Albert is asking, can you do Tai Chi if you have a physical disability and use a cane? So I guess that that's, you know, can you, can you do Tai Chi if you, if you can't stand without help? Um, I think you'd have to be inventive, Albert. I, I, I think there would be, you would be able to do more than you probably think you could actually. But it's very hard to know without seeing you. Uh, I have seen people do amazing things um, with only one leg uh, on, uh, doing Tai Chi. It's hard to say without seeing you. You probably could do more than you imagine you could. One of the things that I did develop uh, for a while when I was living in America was working, because I was working with a few people who had lost the use of their legs and were in wheelchairs, and um, I felt very moved to want to develop a, a, tai chi, a way of doing Tai Chi sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, in case it ever happened to me, really, you know, it was like, I'd like to be able to think I could have this benefit no matter what. And so I developed a way of doing the whole form sitting down. Uh, all these movements would work sitting down as well. Different, of course, but then, you know, it still would pack the punch. And anyway, it's a great thing to do, because uh, oftentimes you're sitting on a train or in a car, and you can do discrete versions of them. Um, uh, and, it, and it works really well. So, yeah, possibly. I can't say for sure, Albert, but possibly. Okay, um, this is an interesting one from Carolyn in uh, in Great Britain. Um, does Tai Chi strengthen bones? It's said to. It's said to. Um, it feels like it does. Um, the um, I was going to say myth, but the the, the direction, the, the the way you're instructed rather, is that the chi uh, develops at first. You feel it moving through. You can actually feel it. It feels like I was saying a kind of fluid sense, like an oil moving through you, um, which as it develops and grows, gradually permeates the bones and enters the, the bone marrow itself, whereupon your bones are stronger and more flexible and uh, like more youthful. They've got more, more life and spring in them. And it does definitely feel like that. Um, yes, it definitely feels like it has an effect on the bones. That's what they say it does. Um, I, I've not proved it myself, but it feels like it does. Now, this is an interesting one uh, for you, because I know on occasions this, this appertains to you. Um, Frank in the UK is saying, can you do Tai Chi with a bad back? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, I, I, like I said, I had a, a bit of um, an injury to myself doing a mad kick once with someone um, when I was about 18, and it stuck the, it kind of sheared the sacroiliac joint at the time. So there has been a propensity for that lower back area to go out occasionally. It's happened a few times in my life. And I uh, wasn't able to do any of my other training. I couldn't even stand up uh, before I got to the chiropractor that I go to, if that or what I've been to when that happened. Um, I, did, did, I could still do the Tai Chi. I mean, it, it, that's the weird thing. It's really weird. It's very, 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 very rare circumstances not to be able to do it. And it really helped the back as well. There's just something about the style of movement that's so unjarring. It's so harmonious with the natural movement of the body. Um, oh, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful art. It really is. Oh, and, and, you know, if I, if I hadn't started it when I was young, I don't think I would. That's the thing. It's just a miracle that it actually came to me when it did. I wouldn't even know how amazing it was. It's just so gorgeous. It is such a gorgeous thing to do. Okay, now Joanna is um, asking, can Tai Chi help arthritis, fibromyalgia, and low energy levels? The, uh, the arthritis, yes, definitely. Fibromyalgia, possibly. Um, I, I, I think there have been studies on that, that it's proven it, that it does. Low energy levels, absolutely. That you feel very soon after taking out the practice. Um, again, low energy is an interesting one because pe different people mean different things by low energy and what kind of energy you're talking about. Um, you know, we all have different versions of what, what energy means to us. But when the, the given wisdom is that with these things, and it's the same with acupuncture when you're treating someone with acupuncture, that the desire, uh, desired outcome is not to achieve new peaks of, 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 of vitality, it's to gradually increase the lowest level of your vital flow. So that if your worst level was, say, you know, I can't move or whatever, that gradually that moves up to like, yeah, yeah, no, I can move, I can move. Um, and then that gets stronger and stronger because that you rely on. And then you'll get your peaks as well, but they're not what you measure it by. And that definitely, definitely happens over a period of time. The body's the lowest level of your energy increases and increases and increases. It just becomes more reliable somehow. So that, I mean, I can undertake ridiculous feats of, of, of um, it, you know, some of the, the things I've done, like writing books uh, in a very short space of time or, you know, that, that kind of thing when you've got a mad project on um, that would normally, have, would otherwise have floored you. Um, it seems to give you that, that ability to stay with something and stay focused and stay calm and keep fluid with it somehow so that you get to finish things very quickly and well without expending huge amounts of energy. Now this is an interesting one from uh, Gerard in Canada. Um, Gerard says, I have heard if you are not electrically grounded, you miss the potential benefits of Tai Chi. Electrically grounded? Uh, I don't totally know what you I know what you mean by being electrically grounded. I would have thought that Tai Chi would help you get, well, it, get, it helps you ground. That's part of the training because you're constantly sinking the, the weight downwards. Um, and so you do gradually become a lot more grounded. That's the idea of it. The electrical part, I don't know. Could you not kind of adjust that with like a battery and a couple of wires and stuff first and then do the Tai Chi and then it would work better? I don't know. I don't know. Alrighty. Um, well, we're over on our, our hour, Stephen, so do you want to just take a couple more questions? Yeah. Alright. This is from Paul in GB, um, who says, how does Tai Chi relate to Kundalini awakening? Uh, well, I, 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 uh, the, the, the Qigong practice that I do, which is the said, mostly Xing Yi based Qigong, uh, I was teaching to a teacher of Kundalini Yoga, not in England, it was somewhere a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember where. And they just jumped up with each other, wow, this is so similar to what I do. It's so similar. Um, and, and that was because of the dynamic strength stuff and I don't know what else. Uh, but that was nice. But the Tai Chi itself, I think, is quite different. Um, the flow of it all has a different effect with Kundalini. It's not quite as startling, actually. I find Kundalini Yoga, when I've, I've been to sessions, there's a sort of startling sensation about it. Like, wow, that's the kind of feeling that you get. With the Tai Chi, it's much more of a mmm feeling. <laughs> I don't know if that means it. 
All right. So if anybody has a burning question, um, please do take the chance to, uh, to pop it in the question box now. Um, there's this one from Jackie in GB, and this is an interesting one. How do I fit in Tai Chi practice when my partner's not interested? Not sure you can answer that one, really, Stephen. I know, Jackie, when I was um, in my... Uh I had my first son, I didn't have him, but my wife had my then wife had our first son when I was twenty four, which is very young, isn't it? And um and he's now thirty three and I was really avidly, avidly, avidly into Tai Chi. That was in my Tai Chi crazy days, you know, and that's all I could think about was Tai Chi. And he I so often was doing the form with him hanging on my ankle and giggling as I had to learn to balance and move my foot through the air with him hanging on to it um, and step it down in a new position with my then wife shouting at me because I hadn't whatever done like his bottle or his napkin or whatever it was I was meant to have done at the same time so I was just doing the Tai Chi I can't understand her doing stuff really but um, nothing got in the way of it actually <laughs> that's what I would say and um, you, could, you just find a way there's just a way everybody is entitled to their own little bit of privacy their own space um, in a relationship. I think it's hard to, to, to exist in a relationship if there isn't that allowed to each other. And so, and it can be done once you know the moves. It's like you could be dancing in the kitchen while your partner was reading a book or cooking some food or doing whatever. And that would be acceptable, wouldn't it? Um, you know, a couple of moments of, of, of a bit of a little dance that you break into. It's exactly the same, especially with this system, because you can just take one posture and just move through it one step, two step, one step, two step, keep going, and then move backwards across the kitchen while they're doing something else. And that would take 30 seconds, and you've done it. And it's like, hmm, that's better. And you carry on. So I think there are ways, if one's inventive, and don't use it as a, as a divisive uh, tool somehow to, to divide the two of you. You use it as a, just something that you're doing, like brushing your teeth or you know, putting your shoes on or something. It's just a function that you fulfill in it during the day. Um, I think perfectly acceptable and um, and fun, and they might want to do it too if they see you moving gracefully. You never know. All right, we'll make fishing this hands. Though I would say that at some point I'm going to do something about the fishing hands, which is amazing in relationships. Um, it's where two people do a kind of a push pull kind of dance, and even if the other person has no interest in Tai Chi at all, everybody enjoys it, and it is brilliant for harmonising the uh, communicational flow between. So. This is the last question, Stephen, and it's from Penny, who says, I find I quite enjoy putting a feminine spin on the Tai Chi moves. Does it take anything away from the practice? Well, Penny, it's hard to know what you mean by feminine spin. <laughs> yes. Um, unless if you mean like a bit of a kind of a flourish, a sort of, a do you mean theatrical flourish? Um, possibly uh, expressiveness in, in, in the movement. Uh, 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 um, you know, like kind of that, that classical Indian dancing where the hands are, are creating beautiful shapes. Now, I, I'm kind of assuming you mean something like that. Um, no, if, if a, it's an art form. If the body wants to express itself that way, then, then that's beautiful. I think as long as we always uh, stick to the principles, the underlying principles of movement with the Tai Chi, the, the way it expresses itself, you know, the, the petals of the flower will somehow take care of themselves. And certain days they'll be, it'll be with more of a flourish, other days it will be more prosaic, uh, depending on your mood at the time. As long as you stick to the principles of moving as a single unit, um, flowing like the wind, everything works fine. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen, very much for uh, your time tonight. And thanks to everybody who's been listening to the webinar. Uh, just to remind you that we do have this special introductory offer on the uh, Barefoot Doctor's Revolutionary Tai Chi Training, which uh, is the easiest and fastest way to learn the Tai Chi short form moves. So the introductory... In the known universe. To the known universe, indeed. Um, the introductory offer is $97. Um, we'll be running that offer just up about until Christmas or until we've got around about 100 people who are taking part, because um, that's a nice number to get some feedback from. So I hope you'll want to be uh, one of those first 100 students. If you do, um, importantly, Maz is, is making me realize that I should 
definitely let you know when you go to the website you need to put in http colon slash slash but I'm sure it'll work just as well with www.barefootdoctorglobal.com forward slash Tai Chi. Um, I will get something up on the home page of the website uh, very rapidly as well so there'll be a link through from there but if you want to uh, avail yourself of that offer tonight you need to go to www.barefootdoctorglobal.com forward slash Tai Chi. So once again thanks for everybody uh, listening on the webinar tonight and a big thank you to you Stephen for once again sharing all your expertise. Oh, it was my utmost pleasure. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have a good gush about Tai Chi. It's the first time I've ever done that in my whole life, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for putting up with it. It's lovely that you were here. Thanks a lot. Bye now.